Are you able to record it now? Thank you. Hare Krishna, we would like to welcome Jeshalakaya Chakshurun Miltam Yena Tasman Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pasha Kadeshatarine Vancha Kalpataru Hischa Krupa Sindhu Pyevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasati Kaura Bhatta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna So I'm grateful to be with all of you today. Thank you for joining and Thank you, Prabhuji. Do I have permission to introduce you? For some of us have recently been initiated. And is it okay? Well, um, by introducing me, you are either insulting me or insulting the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I will let it go then. Which one is it? No, oh, so I think all if if because who we are here now, they all know you. I feel it's yeah, okay. That's what I say that there's no need to introduce yeah. as such. Right. You want to the notes, so I thought I'm supposed to so. <laughs> Yeah. So I'll speak on a question that is repeatedly asked when I'm traveling and I will speak some of my understandings, especially based on what interactions I have with Maharaj, but this specifically, this won't be centered on my interactions with Maharaj because I have found that speaking on when senior devotees speak about their interactions with Maharaj, somehow that ends up creating a poverty mentality among the devotees rather than abundance mentality. Poverty mentality means that, oh, in the mass, Maharaj, Maharaj is so available and he was so accessible to so many devotees and he's not accessible to us now. So it makes us just feel unfortunate and that, that, that should not at all be the feeling that any devotee should ever have. And certainly not any devotee in our God family. So the idea is that just like we don't have access to Prabhupada, but Prabhupada's, Prabhupada is present to us through so many of his blessings. His movement, his followers, his uh, books, his legacy. So like that, we talk about one particular aspect of Maharaj through which his many blessings are manifested in the world. And that is his single-mindedness amid his changing focus. So I have been, as many of you know, I have been studying the Bhagavad Gita quite regularly. That's the main book I focus on. So I was reflecting on, for me, which verse describes Maharaj the most? So I thought of five different verses. And I'll, I'll quickly mention those verses, but then I'll focus on one particular verse. The Yasman no dvijate loko, lokan no dvijate chaiha. Harsha Marsha Bhayodvegar Mukto Yasjame Priya. 
one who is not disturbed by others and one who does not disturb others. So I'll see that Maharaj, he is a person who is generally very non-critical, very careful about no, not speaking or doing things which will agitate or disturb others. He will tell his disciples also, cooperate with the local devotees. You respect my God brothers the way you would respect me. So he's very careful not to disturb others. And at the same time, when he is the target of criticism, when somebody speaks negatively about it, he maintains a very calm, a calm composure by which he can resolve the issues. So I could go into this particular verse, but this verse I'll talk about, but I'll contrast this with another verse. And that is only the focus of my class. That is, Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhi Eke Hakuru Nandana Bahushakha Yanantashya Buddha Yoga That's 241. So, Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhi That is, now the literal translation of this word is, word is this verse is a little more nuanced than what we normally infer it to be. So, clearly it's talking about Buddhi. A.K. Kurunandana. So that part is clear. Buddhi is directed in one direction. Kurunandana. That's referring to Arjuna. Now, the other part is Bahushakha Ya Anantascha. So, there are not only many branches, but in fact, there are unlimited branches for Buddha Yo Avyavasayinam. So, Vyavasayatmika Buddhi, it leads us in one direction. Avyavasayatmika Buddhi leads us in multiple directions. Countless directions. So the word Vyavasaya, Vyavasaya in Hindi or in Marathi, it generally refers to a profession. Hmm? Now Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhi. Now we could translate it as professional intelligence, which doesn't sound to be particularly sweet. But what it means is that in Sanskrit, some of the words in English and Sanskrit, some of the words in Hindi and Marathi, they have similar meanings, but slightly different shades. But Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhi here means like if somebody is professional in their conduct. That means that they don't let uh, unwanted emotions come in the way. Hmm? Uh, that, that person is professional in dealing with me. That means you know, they, they're competent, focus on their job. And there were no other emotions that came. So Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhi means that one is focused on the job at hand and that intelligence so one is professional if somebody comes to as to comes to our place to say fix our laptop we have on-site support and then that person comes for fixing the laptop and that person starts chatting about this and that and that and that and at the end they don't fix the laptop also say, what kind of professional are you so your sayatmika buddhi means that one pointed intelligence comes when one is one is focused atmika, right? One is very deeply identified with the vyavasaya. Now the vyavasaya can mean a material profession. Vyavasaya can also refer to one's spiritual identification, one's spiritual role. So it can a karma yogi who identifies with karma yoga, a bhakti yogi who identifies with bhakti yoga. That person, to the extent they identify. The Atmika Buddhi, the intelligence is identified with their Vyavasaya, so that it almost becomes the core of who they are. Then A.K. Hakurunandana. So often, so here, what it means is that to the extent we are firmly situated in a particular identity, to that extent we will be firmly fixed in the corresponding activity. So what Maharaj is I mean applied to Maharaj. See, Maharaj sees himself very deeply as a servant of Srila Prabhupada. And it is serving Prabhupada, glorifying Srila Prabhupada. That is his primary focus. So when I wrote the book Journey, when I read the book Journey Home first, before it was published, Maharaj had given it to me to go through it and review and give some comments. 
So I had written some few, few books, I had given them to Maharaj before that. So Maharaj knew that I was a writer. So Maharaj asked me, what do you, how did you find the book? So I said, Maharaj, the stories are thrilling, but I especially like the tone of the book, where you are not, I said, Maharaj, what do you mean the tone? He says, that is, you are not a, a teacher over here. You're not coming off as a teacher giving a, giving a discourse. You're coming off as a seeker who is sharing their experiences and their wisdom from the experiences. So Maharaj said, this is the tone that is required for someone who wants to do outreach in the contemporary world, especially Western outreach. People don't like didactic, that somebody sits high up and gives instructions. Hmm. Then, now, now Maharaj has written how it was Bhakti Tith Maharaj's request request before he was departing from the world that he, that, that was the primary motivator for Maharaj to write the book. Hmm. But what was Maharaj's purpose in writing the book? So Maharaj said that my purpose was to glorify Krishna, glorify, glorify Vrindavan, glorify Krishna and glorify Srila Prabhupada. And he said that third part, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that was a very striking point. That I said, I did this to glorify Srila Prabhupada. So, you know, there is, there is exclusive glorification. And I, I talk about this with Maharaj. So in one sense, the book is about his own glory, his extraordinary search, his enormous perseverance, the astonishing experiences that he had. The book is about him. But the purpose is there can be exclusive glorification of Prabhupada and there can be inclusive glorification of Shri Prabhupada. So exclusive glorification is what the genre in which most books about Shri Prabhupada have been written. That means, oh, Prabhupada is such a wonderful, great person. And that's what is the focus. And that's true, no doubt. So... Say, for example, devotees write their memories of Srila Prabhupada. Now, most of those books are relatable largely for people who have already accepted Prabhupada as their teacher or but already accepted Prabhupada's authority. But the way Maharaj is journey home, it is even if somebody doesn't accept Srila Prabhupada as their primary spiritual authority, oh, this person, this Radhanath Swami, Richard Slam, met so many people. And so many great gurus, many of these gurus from the material estimate are bigger than Srila Prabhupada in terms of their, their name and their fame. But he, he met all of them and yet he chose Swami Prabhupada as his guru. So what's so special about Swami Prabhupada? There must be something special. So, so the idea is that even when he was doing something like that, his purpose is to glorify Srila Prabhupada. So so that, that point, you know, Maharaj, if you can say, his life has a three distinct phases. Now, if you look at it from one perspective, that you can say that he had his first phase was his, means within this Krishna conscious movement, his first phase was Nivrindavan, where also there were two sub phases. One was, he was doing Pujari services. Second, he was doing college Pravachi. Many of the temples, like the Columbus temple, which we have presently, that was actually personally bought by Maharaj during the course of his college outreach. Hmm. Then after that, his community development phase, that was around 1987 onwards, started coming to India, spending more and more time in India. So around 1987 to 2004-2005, that was primarily his community development phase. He was based in India, he was traveling abroad, going to America to various places, even Daavan also, but his focus was on developing the community in India. And then once the journey home came about, that from that phase onward now, like the third phase is this Western outreach phase. So one devotee recently asked Maharaj, Maharaj that in the past, it seems that you were focused more on, on people, but now you seem focused on projects. Mm -hmm. That now the GV, GV is a big project, Buffer Center is a big project. And big project means there are big requirements also. So Maharaj said, no. 
He says, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing his words. He says that, you know, what are projects for? Projects are for people. The, we want to take care of people, but how do we take care of people? By having projects that they can take care of and projects that can take care of both ways. So people can need projects to take care of and then the projects will take care of people. So if you can say counselor system is also a project. I think my, many of you must have heard Maharaj talk about how when he would uh, he had urged the senior devotees and other people to start a counselor system. This is 86, 80, 87, 88, 89. He says every year while he would be there for five, six months, he would consistently talk about them. I talk about it and urge them to have meetings. And then he would go abroad. At that time, there was no phone. Inter phone was not so common and internet was not there at all. The six months later, when I would come back, the whole system would have collapsed. One year, two year, three year, nobody was carrying it forward. And finally, Maharaj had to push it and then, then it took off. So it was a system. Maharaj is focusing on the system, but the project as a system, system of project, that was for taking care of people. So uh, the idea is that for Maharaj, his focus has always been on this one, one Yaspuja offering. His Prabhupada Yaspuja offering Maharaj was in India in Gopinath Temple. So he spoke that um, he recollected how when the new palace of gold was being built, so the devotees asked Prabhupada, should we fill this palace with jewels? And Prabhupada said, the devotees with the jewels would fulfill this palace. So Maharaj said that now today on Prabhupada's Vyasa, what is our offering to Prabhupada? He said, this is our community is itself the offering to Shri Prabhupada. He said, all of you are like the jewels who have formed a beautiful necklace and is this necklace that is being offered to Shri Prabhupada. So for him, this focus was always there that we are offering to Shri Prabhupada. So the people, the projects, they're all, it's like, you know, we, we exist in a chain of relationships. So if you see Maharaj is here, Maharaj is a relationship with his disciples is here. His relationship with his God brothers is here. His relationship with Prabhupada is here. So for him, his defining identity is based on his relationship with Prabhupada. Hmm? And then as a service to Srila Prabhupada, he has a relationship with his God brothers. As a service to Srila Prabhupada, he has a relationship with his disciples. As a service to Srila Prabhupada, he has a relationship with many, many other people. Those who are prospective devotees, those who are well-wishers. So that is his focus. And how can he best serve Srila Prabhupada? That is Maharaj's constant vision. And it struck me right from the early days that um, when I was about to, when I had the opportunity, I had given my GRE and I had the opportunity to go to America. So I decided after some time that I will not go, go to America for higher studies. So then Radhisham once introduced um, me that he had an opportunity to Maharaj, he had an opportunity to go to America for higher studies, but he decided to stay on in India. So Maharaj said, by Prabhupada's mercy, now you will get the highest knowledge. And he quoted Raja Vidya, Raja Guhiyam. Hmm? So, this is the highest knowledge which you can... It's a, so, that time, the, the Kolkata project came to Maharaj. And when that project came, Maharaj needed devotees to assist. So, from Pune, I was based in Pune at that time. In 2007, I was in Pune, then I started traveling and then I was based in Mumbai thereafter. I was assisting Maharaj in one of his books and other services. And then mostly I'm traveling abroad. So anyway, at that time, uh, Maharaj told Radhisham Prabhu that, can you send these, these devotees to Pune? And from Pune to Kolkata. He says, Maharaj, he said that, Radhisham said, you know, Maharaj, I'll do whatever you say, but we need these devotees in Pune. Pune, is, Pune has grown and a lot of services here. And Maharaj replied was very simple. He said, now, if you ask Prabhupada, which project is more important from him, Pune or Kolkata? What will Maharaj, what will Prabhupada say? <laughs> so he says, Prabhupada, Prabhupada, it is Prabhupada's birthplace. Now, if uh, any of you have been to Kolkata on your way to Mayapur, so both the places, the Prabhupada's birthplace, we have got, we're building a beautiful temple there and the Ultananga Junction where Prabhupada and Prabhupada, 
Pakistan Chakur made that place also we have got. And there also we are building beautiful, there already is a temple and they have reno renovated and beautified it. So, you know, Prabhupada is one of the most illustrious, even from material perspective, one of the illustrious sons of Kolkata. But beyond Kolkata, there is not a sufficiently glorious monument befitting Shila Prabhupada's glory. So Mahas is focused on that. And then, now he knows very well that when he's going to focus on one thing, see the nature of single-mindedness is that when we focus on one thing, then other things will get neglected. But <clears throat> I was once talking with Maharaj about, uh, about how you know, I, I, I was doing editing services and I had opportunity to do editing services for several devotees. And I said, Maharaj, you know, there are sannyasi gurus for which I'm doing editing. I said, it's difficult for me to do for all of them. Mm, and what should I do? I don't feel that I can say no to any of them because they're all senior devotees, Prabhupada, disciples, sannyasis, gurus. But I can't do everything. And then Maharaj says something very striking. His talk, Maharaj often talks about humility. Uh, but here he gave a very deep definition of humility. Or not deep, maybe it's relevant at that point to me. Humility means to accept that we can't do everything that we want to do. And to accept the displeasure of those whom we can't serve. It's quite a grave definition. Humility means that we can't do everything that we want to do. And when we say no to some people, that means those people may be displeased. But we have to focus on how best we can serve. Of course, we take guidance from our spiritual masters, senior devotees. But that single-mindedness means that some things will definitely get neglected. So when Maharaj came to India, you know, he had a flourishing college outreach going on in America. He was told to come to India and base himself in India. And the whole college outreach in one sense collapsed without him. But when he was told to be in India, he focused on that. And that's how the Radha Gopinath community and the whole project came up. When Maharaj got an opportunity for Western outreach, at that time, uh, he, was, he was quite actively involved in the management of New Vrindavan. And then Maharaj eventually uh, decided for health reasons and various reasons that he could not play any constructive role over there. So when he resigned from there, it's all for a decade or so, Maharaj didn't go back to New Vrindavan at all. He met devotees wherever they, wherever they came across his path when he was there. But once he started focusing on one thing, he focused on one thing. So now, from Srila Prabhupada's perspective, what Srila Prabhupada wanted was an international society for Krishna consciousness. And not an Indian society for Krishna consciousness with international branches. So, now of course at one time, uh, and I was talking to Maharaj Chicago, he said that the Indians we are getting in America or in the Western world in general, they are extremely high class people. You know, during Srila Prabhupada's times, if even one Indian like this had been there to assist Srila Prabhupada in a pre iskon or even the post iskon phase, before 1965 or even 1970s to 75, if one Indian would be there, Prabhupada would have been overjoyed. Prabhupada would have been so grateful. So he says that we value everyone who is coming to Srila Prabhupada's lotus feet. But at the same time, he said that Prabhupada wanted that people from all denominations join the movement. And his, his focus is, Maharaj told me that, uh, he says, if I do a program in New York, they may get 100 people to come for a program. If I do a program in London, they may get 300 or 500 people to come for a program. If I do a program in Mumbai, they'll get 1,000 or 5,000 people to come for a program. Hmm? But he said, Prabhupada said that New York is the most important city in the world. And he says, that is why by Shri Prabhupada's mercy, uh, and we have got an opportunity to do something in New York. So in one sense, from Maharaj's perspective, it is actually an austerity for him. I was talking with one devotee who who, who is like an editor, reviewer for Maharaj. And there's a team which 
or supplies Maharaj with, and he makes the short videos or gives contemporary talks. The team which supplies some ideas, some content, and they are all often surprised how much aware Maharaj is of these things. And then at one time, so Maharaj was telling this devotee once that, that you know, I would much rather be reading Chaitanya Charitamrita than speaking in Chaitanya Lila to devotees and not speak on like basics of spirituality to corporate companies where there is, a, where you cannot speak anything about the Lord directly. But he says, that is the service that I've been called to do now. So for him also, it's an austerity, not just in terms of the number of people who come for a program. It's like somebody has a choice. You go here, you have 1,000 people coming. You go here, you have 50 people coming. Most people would go to the place where 1,000 people are going to come. But Mahesh is consciously choosing a place where there are less people coming for programs. It's austerity. So the austerity is not just in that there are lesser people coming for the programs, but also the austerity is in terms of the content that is being spoken. As those who are devoted to Krishna, even we as devotees would like to speak more about Krishna directly than indirectly. That's what gives us joy. And Maharaj has been so devoted to Krishna for more than half a decade for him to speak basic spiritual topics. He speaks them beautifully when he has to. But that is an austerity for him. And why is he doing this austerity? Because he feels that is a big need for Srila Prabhupada's moment. For Srila Prabhupada, that is the austerity that he is doing. This is Srila Prabhupada when he was in Jalguta, uh, he celebrated Janmashtami. Pre previously in that, all the Janmashtamis, he was in Vrindavan. And Vrindavan is so rich for a festival like Janmashtami. Everyone around is devoted to Krishna and it's filled with spiritual energy and ebullience. But on Jalduta, there was no one. At least there were some Indians who were the staff and Prabhupada cooked food, who made a feast and offered them the feast and spoke something about Krishna. But then the next year when the Gaur Purnima came, at that time, Prabhupada was all alone in New York in the Lower East Side. And practically no one whom he was talking with even knew about Chait Lord Chaitanya. And they were all so new that Prabhupada couldn't even speak about Lord Chaitanya to them. So Prabhupada writes in Jalduta diary that all my God brothers will be celebrating discussions about Lord Chaitanya in Mayapur and in Jagannath Puri and in Rindavan. And I'm all, alone. I'm, I'm all alone so far away. She says, but I'm here for the service of my spiritual master. So for Srila Prabhupada, it was an austerity to be in America in the old age. And similarly, for Maharaj, when he's focusing on Western outreach, it is an austerity. And sometimes we may, as devotees, most of us who are from an Indian background, we may feel that Maharaj doesn't have enough time for us that Maharaj doesn't respond to our emails, is not so accessible to us. And that is true. It is true. But then there is a higher sacrifice involved over here. There is, it is not that Maharaj doesn't want to be with us. For him, his defining identity is not that he is the guru of his disciples. Till now, whenever I have talked with Maharaj, Maharaj, I had not heard Maharaj use this word, my disciple. You know, most, and there's nothing wrong in using it. Most gurus use it and that's perfectly a functional word. Now some gurus say, I have got a disciple over there and I go and stay at his house when I visit this place or XYZ. So Maharaj will say usually, you know, some devotees from other Gupta temple are over there. Other devotees of Bhakti Center, they organize nice programs. So Maharaj, I have practically never you heard him use the word my disciple. Not that he never uses it, but that Maharaj doesn't define himself that way. Maharaj sees himself as first and foremost, his, his Relationship is with Srila Prabhupada. His defining identity is that he is a servant of Srila Prabhupada. And whatever is required for the service of Srila Prabhupada, he will do that. So if that means uh, accepting disciples, he will do that. that. If that means reaching out to people who extend far beyond his disciples, you know, who may be far away from even ever becoming his disciples, that's also, uh, that's also uh, he will do that. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, I was in the Govardhan Eco Village for two, two and a, uh, almost two years. Before I, before that, I was traveling extensively. After that, I also I mean, started traveling now. But during that time, I also started realizing not just globally how much the impact has been there, but even in India. See, the, the when I see Maharaj said that 
projects are for people so that people can do seva and people can be cared for so one of the key contributions of maharaj has been to take krishna consciousness to people who would normally not be reached by iskon that was giving a bhagavatam class in in gv and then uh, there's one woman who came and sat right in front but generally men sit on one side women sit on other side but she came right and sat in front very close to the speaker so there was a security over there the security started coming and telling her you can sit behind but then there was one senior devotee over there who said no don't disturb her and then i i was giving the class and i looked at her i thought she looks familiar i couldn't identify her and then that devotee was adikesha prabhu many of you know him who told the security guard don't disturb him and after the class got over adikesha prabhu came to me and he, he approached the mother and both of them came and he says uh, he said that you know she is a famous bollywood actress he says she is juhi chawla now i hadn't seen movies for <laughs> i haven't seen movies for 25 years so it did strike me at that time but she has just come nonchalantly come in and she sat down and is hearing bhagavatam class and devotee told me that many times very big celebrities they come there and they just feel feel at home in gv and they are not the whole culture has been made in such a way that oh it's non intrusive just experience bhakti experience krishna that don't push people initially when the govardhan kavale started when many western people would come many new people would come maharaj specifically told the brahmacharis and the other preachers says don't tell anyone to chant hari krishna he said just let them experience krishna in fact in those days if anybody would take a bead bag and they would come with a bead bag in front to maharaj Uh, maharaj asked who told you to chant he says they they would say no no one told us we just so everyone doing we thought we'd also buy it so maharaj's mood is that let people experience krishna and let them take it explore it on their own don't push it and that attracts so many people so in india also not what to speak of western outreach in india also the kind of people who are being reached to projects like over the nico village it's extraordinary there are dozens and dozens of uh, international embassies and ambassadors who have come to govardhan eco village because when they come they come with their families and they want them to show what is india and gv has become like a beautiful experience of what spiritual and natural india is so gorang pro has got opportunities to talk at various embassies and he's been invited to various countries through his talks at those embassies it all happened because of the ambassador scheme there so that we are reaching a large number of people and for maharaj in one sense the gv project is uh, is an unparalleled project in among all the projects that he has done but for him it's not just a project it is a project as it that engages people and then it 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 uh, it, it cares for people thereafter so when i had asked maharaj about you know is i told maharaj you have done so many things which are not normally done in scon we have yoga outreach then we have environmental outreach and then we have uh, um, educational outreach i don't know how many of you know this that you know when initially if you see in rural india the educational infrastructure is quite poor so when we built gv at that time what happened was that the local villagers they said there's so much opulence over here so naturally there could be some negative feelings some envy some animosity so to build bridges some of the brahmacharis from there started going to the schools and they wanted to teach bhagavad gita but the people were not very interested so they said no 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 but then they came to know that these brahmacharis are like they are engineers and they are from big universities so they found that the local school science teachers were not very good so they asked the brahmacharis to come and teach science in the schools and now initially the devotee is thought you know why should we do that we would not become brahmacharis to teach science to students but then they thought about it that this is an opportunity for us to contribute to the broader community and they did that and they turned out these brahmacharis turned to be far better science teachers than the science teachers and the teachers and the school managers were so pleased by that that now they have standing invitation to teach bhagavad gita systematically and like openly based on prabhupada's bhagavad gita in so many schools in the vicinity 
So the idea is that if we are just a little bit open. So when I asked Maharaj about this, Maharaj told me that actually for us, our interest is Krishna. But yoga, environment, all these are means by which we can get people, give people an opportunity to associate with devotees in a non-preachy setting. Uh, in a non preachy setting. Now, he didn't use the word non preachy in a non forceful, non intrusive setting. That was the broad the kind of word he used. I don't remember exactly. But that is a very important principle that not many people may want to come and sit and hear a class. But given an environment, they will experience. In that environment, they will experience Krishna. So, for him, when he sees that this is his service to Shila Prabhupada, but that service to Shila Prabhupada can take many different forms and it can bring many, many more people closer to Shila Prabhupada, closer to Krishna. So for us, yes, we may not get immediate association of Maharaj, and, but that does not mean that Maharaj doesn't care for us. Now, many of you may have seen the video of uh, Maharaj with the, de the devotee from Uh, from Chicago and Sundari Mataji that she and she was in her last stages Maharaj was there with her on Zoom for a significant amount of time several hours being with her and uh, encouraging her so when it it's really important we also know it's Tok Krishna Prabhu how Maharaj was there with him how Maharaj cancelled his plans for every, everything that he was doing to be the, at the last at the final time with Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj. So, oh, the Maharaj's heart is there for, he would like to be there with everyone. But it is just not finite, it is finitely, based on finite possibilities to focus on some things. So, when he's focusing on certain things, then certain other things may get neglected. But that does not mean a lack of care. It just means that there is a purpose that has to be fulfilled. And we conclude with this metaphor that when Dashrut Maharaj had to exile Lord Ram, uh, now it was not that Dashrut disliked Ram, nor did Ram disrespect Dashrut. Uh, but the circumstance was such that the two had to be separated. And while the two of them were separated, actually, they came closer to each other. Dashrat Maharaj never felt as much his longing for Lord Ram as he felt when Ram had gone away. So it was for preserving the word that they had to do it. For many of us, our situation is like that, that we don't want to put us in the position of Dashrat Maharaj, but we love to have the association of Maharaj, but actually Maharaj has a higher service. And now, does that mean that he is not available for us? No, he has created a legacy. Uh, we have talked with, there are broad, three broad things. So when, when Maharaj is focusing on Western outreach, it's austerity for him. But does that mean that he's neglecting the other devotees? No. When I talk with him, so he said three things to me. Now, again, these are three things at different times, not just one, two, three, a number. But he said that first is that Indians have a natural piety by which they can actually uh, take to bhakti very easily. If Western people have a natural piety, that will only inspire them to go to the religion of their birth or their community. It won't inspire them to come towards Krishna, generally speaking. Second is, ISKCON as it exists is very much suited for taking care of the needs of Indians, spiritual and cultural needs of Indians. But ISKCON as it exists is not catered for taking care of Westerners right now. And third is, that within ISKCON, so with the natural piety, with the ISKCON's current uh, setup, within that, Maharaj has created a system like council systems, he has, he has senior devotees who, are, who can act as shiksha gurus, and there are systems of care provided for the helping those devotees grow. So yes, everybody could be benefited by Maharaj's presence, but feels that Indians can move onwards. So rather than seeing this as a sign of uh, neglect, we can see this as a sign of trust. That Maharaj actually trusts that we can take responsibility and we can 
we can grow in our spiritual life and we can help in his mission. So that he doesn't, that he's not able to give us time is not a sign of neglect. It's a sign of trust. Like if, uh, if, if parents have multiple children and one child is very responsible and dedicated and competent and another child is maybe sick or negligent or whatever, the parents may focus more on the second child. Now again, again this is not to minimize Western or this whatever, but that does not mean that the first child is not acknowledged or valued. So we see this as an opportunity. Now, a disciple is not meant to burden the shoulder of the spiritual master. A disciple is meant to shoulder the burden of the spiritual master. Not burden the shoulder, but shoulder the burden. And that is an opportunity that we all have, especially those of, uh, those of you who are based in the West. That opportunity is there. That in whatever way we can, whether it is by his helping Western outreach or whether it is helping in continuing Srila Prabhupada's legacy by ourselves practicing bhakti and helping in the local project, local devotees, the local temple management in continuing on the legacy of Srila Prabhupada. No, we are being trusted to shoulder the burden of the spiritual master. And that way we can reciprocate the single-mindedness by playing our part in his service to Srila Prabhupada. So I'll summarize. I spoke broadly three points today. I spoke on broadly the theme of Maharaj's single-mindedness in his service to Srila Prabhupada. So among the various phases that Maharaj went through, whether it was in Vrindavan or in India or in the West, his single-minded, uh, consistent focus has been how can I serve Srila Prabhupada? That is his defining idea. That's Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhi. That. So in that connection, I talked about how Western outreach actually is austerity for Maharaj also. In terms of the reciprocation that he gets from people, in terms of the content that he has to prepare and speak. But he's doing it because he sees that that is a great, great need for Srila Prabhupada's movement to actually remain an international movement. And that does not mean that he, does, he neglects his, his Indian devotees. He values them, appreciates them. He's there in moments of need, like the final journey, the final test, the final transition. But beyond that, rather than seeing this as neglect, we can see this as trust, that we have an opportunity to shoulder the burden of our spiritual master and not burden the shoulder by feeling neglected or by demanding, requesting, insisting that we get attention. Rather, we become a part of the mission and we we'll feel we will feel Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada and Krishna's presence through our service to Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Are there any Hare questions? Krishna, thank you so much, Ruhu. Amazing, amazing explanation of mood of Maharaj and how we can relate with that and how we not become the burden, but shoulder the burden. Thank you. Also, the uh, primary identity was very relevant in terms of how Maharaj connects with us and how we can be part of that. Thank you for uh, during your travel to Australia, Australia making time for us. Uh, we truly appreciate your presence and how you connected us to Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. Happy to be here. Anybody else wants to have a comment? Yes, Prajraj Gopal Prabhu. Thank you, Shri Prabhu. Dhanwaj Pramadeshwar Prabhu. Thank you so much for, for elucidating so, much, so many of Maharaj's, uh, Maharaj's mood. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, uh, may I ask? Yes, bro. Uh, you may ask one, and I may not answer. I'm just joking. So, Prabhuji, you were talking about how um, there is an exclusive glorification and an inclusive glorification. Uh, so, when we want to inclusively glorify our Guru Maharaj or even Srila Prabhupada and our Acharyas to, um, say, a Western audience, what does that inclusive glorification entail and what are some pitfalls which cause us to make it exclusive? 
Well, first of all, exclusive glorification is itself not a bad thing. In general, in today's world, the, the, it is an inclusivist ethos. An exclusivist means made of religion saying that this is the only way. So Bhakti Rao Thakur says, um, ISKCON has published a statement on ISKCON and interfaith. So in that they are quoted Bhakti Rao Thakur. Bhakti Rao Thakur says that there is no point in trying to prove the controversial superiority of one's own faith over other faiths or one's own teacher over other teachers. Although a seeker or a disciple may have that faith for one's own conviction. I may personally feel that you know, the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition is the greatest, that my Guru Maharaj is the greatest. But I don't have to focus on that when I'm speaking with the world. So there is, there is a subjective, there, there's subjective side that is rasa, and there's an objective side that is the tattva. So it is not that the Vrajivasis and Ayodhya Vasis are fighting with each other. Is, Raju, is Krishna and Vrindavan greatest or Ram and Ayodhya greatest? No, it's a matter of rasa. And the rasa is what is most important. So for us, when we talk about inclusive glorification, my understanding would mean, so exclusive glorification in our hearts, that we can feel that this is, this is the best spiritual master, this is the greatest spiritual master, whatever. If you want to feel like that, there's nothing wrong in that. But when we are talking with others, it is rather than, rather than simply stating how great Maharaj is, how great Shila Prabhupada is. You know, there are two things. It's through the action, through our behavior, through the actions that we do, and through the insights that we share. People should want to feel, hey, hey, you know, what you talk and how you, how you walk. Both of these are so special. What makes you tick? And then say, oh, this is Shila Prabhupada. So instead of hiding behind Shri Prabhupada, you know, I am a follower of Prabhupada. Don't you dare criticize me. I am a follower of Maharaj. Don't disrespect me. Hmm? Rather than hiding behind Prabhupada and Maharaj, rather we, we represent Shri Prabhupada, represent Maharaj in such a way that people will want to know, okay, you know, what makes you tick? And we can, then we can give the credit to Maharaj and Prabhupada. So if you see, in journey home, Maharaj isn't directly, uh, it's not every paragraph is talking about Prabhupada. Even when he's talking about Rindavan, he's talking about Rindavan. He's talking about his experience of Rindavan. And he never met Shila Prabhupada, he talks about Prabhupada. But the idea is he eventually surrenders to Shila Prabhupada. So there is a, there is a, there is something melodramatic way of glorifying, where you know, there's artificial heightening of emotions which can appeal to some people, but thoughtful people just get put off. This is just a big, big excess drama like that. So my understanding is if through the wisdom that we realize and share and through the, through the service attitude, through the behavior, through the virtues that we exhibit, we will be able to attract people. And that will be the greatest glorification of Mar Guru Maharaj, Shri Prabhupada, and ultimately Krishna. Does it answer your question? Thank you, Prabhu. Um, Thank you. Well, what I understand is walk the talk, uh, and, and actually from our sadhana show our uh, show those virtues which glorify our Guru Maharaj. The same yes. those virtues which no, are present. I wouldn't just walk the talk. I would say we have to talk also because in bhakti talking is also a part of the walking. Hmm? Because mm -hmm. when we are talking, also if you are speaking about Krishna, that glorification of Krishna is also bhakti. So when we say walk the talk, it, it seems that walking is one thing and talking is another thing. No, in the part, in walking is a big thing that includes talking. So just because somebody is talking does not necessarily mean they're not walking. Hmm? Because if somebody is actually talking about Krishna in a, in a way that inspires our hearts, and, uh, and of course they're, they're also themselves devoted to Krishna, then the talking is also walking. So yeah, it's walk the talk, and then you can say talk the walk. <laughs> mm. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you. Um, my last question was, um, yeah. yeah, as you were mentioning, um, for Guru Maharaj, this his seva to preach to new people is actually an austerity for him. And uh, 
and he's doing it out of his desire to please uh, Srila Prabhupada. And so um, for us, we are not, uh, we, we are nowhere near in terms of his example, but we may desire to serve him in that way. And, uh, but for us, the problem is we are not pure enough to feel like this is a service. We may do it because we are dovetailing our passions. So is that still, uh, is, is purification, uh, you know, going to happen? Because we are, for Maharaj, it may be an austerity to speak to, uh, uh, to, to do something to, you know, go and speak to corporate people. For me, yes, I, I mean, I like to speak, so I will go and do it and think that's that, oh, this fine. is a that's service. So that's my confusion. See, if there's something which we like to do and we do it, does that mean that there's no purification? Now, if we look at it, the way nature is designed by Krishna, we see that nature has arranged uh, in such a way that the abilities and the forms that organisms have that living beings have, are suited to the environment in which they operate. That is just efficiency. So we have camels with big humps and they occur in the deserts where there's less water and they can store water. And now scientists may, or atheistic scientists may attribute it only to evolution and not see any divine hand in it. But we don't have to have such a reduction equation. So the point is nature is organized efficiently that what is needed for a particular environment is provided for those in that environment. And those who are in that environment, those who are provided with something for a particular environment, thrive in that environment. So if we have been given some interests, some talents, then we are meant to use those and we will use those in the areas that we thrive. The whole principle of Varanashram is that dotailing our passion is not a concession, it's a recommendation. It's not that because you have passion to do this. No, you have been given this passion for this. So it's that's what we are meant to do actually. That we find what is of our interest and we do that for Krishna. And that was the one point I did not get to explain. I don't know if some of you have heard about this Ganga Jamuna Saraswati project. Basically, Triveni. Basically, what happened was that as the Radha Gopna temple community expanded as more and more devotees were there. Initially, when the community was small, every devotee was doing whatever service was required to be done. But over the years, as the community expanded, there are sufficient devotees doing many services. Then, devotees also started feeling a, feeling a longing to do what is close to their heart, what they feel is important. So some devotees felt that, that the bhakti that we are teaching is very high. And not many people are going to take it up. But uh, we need to establish basic dharma. And if we don't do that, you know, if we don't talk about basic morality, basic, we don't take care of basic needs of people, then those people will get influenced by other people, maybe by anti-Vedic forces. They may become Christ they may get converted to Christianity for material allurements. They may be they may be deceived or allured by Islamic propaganda. They feel that. We want to do something in that, that direction. And initially, somebody would say, oh, that's all just mundane, that's all just Maya. You know, we should just be chanting Hare Krishna and telling others to chant Hare Krishna. But when Maharaj was introduced to Maharaj, when this, this sort of concern became very strong, they brought it to Maharaj. And Maharaj said that uh, Shri Prabhupada brought us Vedic culture. And Vedic culture, in that we have the, we have the three Vedi. Three Vedi is three sacred rivers flowing and coming together. So, so Triveni says, the Maharaj says, Jamuna, she's the river of devotion. Then Ganga is the river of nutrition. Ganga gives water and that's how people sustain their lives. And Saraswati is the goddess of education. So he said that Iskon itself, in its mainstream expressions, will, will be like the Yamuna, focusing on devotion. But there are some devotees in Iskon who may be inspired to manifest Saraswati. They may focus on education. They can establish gurukuls where there's multifaceted education, including spiritual education, start schools, or even provide education for underprivileged people. And then we can have the uh, we have Ganga, which provides nutrition. That means 
you know, food and basic necessities can be provided. So the midday meal that is started by ISKCON Bangalore, it is a government initiative, but ISKCON Bangalore has been associated with that. I mean, has come, become synonymous with it, that they are big, but the Anamrit project, which is started by the Radhagopinath community is also huge. And now it is spread all over India. There are, there are millions of food plates that are distributed. But somehow because uh, midday meal was the first early bird that caught the fish, they, they are well, more well-known in Anamrit. But the idea is that those who have, devotees who have that desire to do some humanitarian work, they can do it within the ambit of bhakti. So it's not that just because, uh, so, so whatever is our driving passion, we can use it in Krishna service. And in fact, creating the facility for different devotees to serve according to their inspiration, uh, according to what inspires them, what drives them, may well be actually Maharaj's greatest contribution that his greatest contribution is not just that he's manifested Radha Gopinath temple or the Jagodhariko village or his written journey home. These are all extraordinary. But perhaps the greatest contribution as a leader that Maharaj has made is that you know, he has been able to engage and encourage and empower devotees with very widely differing natures. And he has been able to help them all blossom in their service. And so once I was talking with Maharaj about one place in America where there were two devotees uh, two from our God family who were doing a lot of Western outreach. But somehow they were not uh, gelling well with the temple. At least the temple had some concerns. So when I visited the temple, the temple had uh, expressed a lot of concerns or complaints about them. So when I told Maharaj about that, Maharaj said, I know those devotees. He says, they are doing wonderful service. And they are so dedicated. And if Shila Prabhupada had been here, says Prabhupada would have told them, you start your own temple and you become temple presidents. And you do your outreach. It's Prabhupada was into empowering people, not restricting people. And he said, as far as the temple, the temple leaders are also dedicated. But they have a particular vision of how Krishna consciousness is to be spread. Or what Krishna consciousness is. And these devotees don't fit into that vision. So he said that I will talk with them. You don't worry about it. And his point was mainly that you know, we have many empowered devotees in our movement. But we don't have sufficient empowered leaders who can engage empowered devotees. That if there are empowered devotees. They will not be just yes men and yes women. They will, they will have their vision. They will have their inspiration. They will have their passion. They will want to serve Krishna accordingly. And an empowered leader is one who is able to accommodate and engage such devotees. And so Maharaj doesn't get too much into the nitty-gritties of specific projects. Maharaj does projects not by project management, but by people management. Now for some devotee who has a lot of energy and vigor to do big projects, the Maharaj will Maharaj will give that person big projects. Maharaj will expect accountability and push that person to do a lot. For some of his disciples who are more, you know, who are not so much project oriented. No, they may spend time, hours talking with people, encouraging people, engaging people and uh, engaging, engaging with people. And uh, if that's what they're doing, Maharaj will not ask them. You know, he never ask them how much funds have you raised or what targets have you met. Now, Maharaj values and appreciates different devotees based on how they are contributing according to their particular, particular sabhava, their nature. And that kind of leadership is what will actually uh, not only uh, organically establish Varnashram in our movement. Maharaj is not a person who constantly talks about we have to establish Varnashram, we have to establish Varnashram. What Maharaj does is he actually engages people according to their nature, encourages people to be engaged according to nature. And through that, organically, Varnashram will manifest. But more than that, through that, devotees will be happy when they are serving Krishna. Because when we act according to our nature, then along with spiritual happiness, which sometimes can be very high up for us, we get material happiness that is in harmony with spiritual happiness. And that's what can keep us sustained in our long journey toward Krishna. Hope that answers the question. Hare Krishna. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see so many of you. Yeah. Thank you, Gauranjan Prabhu, for organizing this. Thank you, Krishna Muli. Thank you so much, Prabhu. I think you have a travel to Hare Krishna. Take care. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Good to see you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Take care. Hare Krishna. Take care. Hare Krishna. We couldn't meet when I was in Seattle. For next time when I come. Yes. Thanks, Prabhuji. Nice to hear from you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Devi Vadi Gamataji. Nice to see you also. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Paul. Jai Rasishwar Gopal Prabhu. Take care. Hare Paul, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Thank you. Okay. I didn't know the other book. Yes, sorry. I thought they were only one. Hare Krishna. Jai. Jai. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining. I just have to leave. I have another program here. Thank you. Yes, Prabhuji. Thank you. 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 Thank you.